Hello and welcome to Your Story Stinks, the podcast where I talk about terrible stories and books. Today we're going to be talking about The Mister by E.L. James. So before we get into it, I need to preface this with a lot of information. But the first thing I need to say is that this is not going to be a chapter-by-chapter review. In fact, I'm probably not going to talk about the way the book is written or the characters or the setting or anything like that for a very long time. And the reason is is that none of it really matters when talking about the book. And you might be saying, hold on a moment. Isn't this supposed to be discussing the book and reviewing it? How are you going to do that without talking in depth about the book itself. And the reason I can do this is because E.L. James's writing is as vast as the ocean and as deep as a puddle. She is a master of writing a lot and not saying anything. The reality is, if you don't know what this is, if you're at all familiar with Fifty Shades of Grey, you're familiar with this story because E.L. James changed the characters slightly, and then wrote the same story. And we're going to get into that, don't worry. But if that's all I was going to talk about, if that's the only thing I had issues with, I could just talk about Fifty Shades of Grey. But the reality is is that I'm not going to. At least I'm not going to talk about those stories specifically. And the reason for that is that on this podcast, I try to focus on things that are interesting bad or at least things that are interesting to me. There are a lot of stories out there that are really bad, but if they're not interesting to talk about, I don't really see a need to review them in depth. There are lots of bad romance stories. There are lots of bad stories in general, but that doesn't mean that they're bad enough that they're worth talking about. If I was going to talk about Fifty Shades of Grey, I would just call it, like, slightly risque erotica for wine moms, and that would be the whole review. You really don't need to say anything else about it, because you know what it is just from cultural osmosis. The other thing is that Fifty Shades of Grey and its two sequel books really don't tell you very much about the author, in the same way that a first album by a band doesn't really tell you a whole lot about the band. One-hit wonders are almost never defined as artists by whatever their one hit is, in my opinion. Like, yeah, you might think you know about them, but the reality is, is that's just a snapshot. It doesn't tell you a whole lot. In my opinion, if you want to understand a band, you really need to look at their second album. And the reason for that is because the first album is where all of their best ideas go. They work the longest on that one, they spend all of their creative energy on that one, and they put everything into that one first impression. The second album, and the reason why so many have a sophomore slump, is because at that point they've already used all their best ideas. But it's the best way to understand what the band themselves, what the writers of the songs, what the musicians, what's in their head. At that point, they're trying to either capitalize on their success or they're trying to do or create what they themselves are passionate about. You'll learn the most by looking at a second album, is what I'm saying. In the same way, you will probably learn the most about an author's second work or second series. The first work in E.L. James's catalog, Fifty Shades of Grey, was famously Twilight fan fiction, which means that she wrote it, somebody else looked at it, helped her kind of edit it, and then shoved it out there as its own work. But that doesn't really tell you a whole lot about her as an author or what she's into. It just tells you what she did to slightly modify the story or what she was kind of into. The second work, the work that is separate from the phenomenon, the work that is her choice to release, tells you way more about her. Because again, she already wrote a best-selling series. She already made all of her money. She already had the movie rights. She already essentially hit the peak. If she wanted to, she could never write again. But she didn't. 
she chose to write another series. A series which looks a lot like the first series, to the point where the main male character in this series is slightly related to Christian Grey in Fifty Shades of Grey. But you can't really just analyze what's on the page and call it a day if you want a full accounting of why this story is bad and what's really going on here. Because there's a lot going on around the story with James, with the culture, with everything else. I usually despise critiques that are like, what does this say about the culture? But in reality, Fifty Shades of Grey tells you a lot about the culture. A lot of things in terms of how people approach books like this and why books like this are being written and why they are successful says a lot about this current cultural moment. And so I don't think you can really analyze the mister without talking about all this. In fact, I think the mister is a better place to analyze E.L. James and this topic than Fifty Shades of Grey is, and I will talk about that. So I want you, as a listener, to begin this by realizing that, in my opinion, the mister is more informative about E.L. James than... Fifty Shades of Grey is. It's more informative about the audience than Fifty Shades of Grey is. And to start this, we need to ask a question, which is, why did Fifty Shades of Grey become successful? That's not a rhetorical question. There's a specific reason why Fifty Shades of Grey became a phenomenon. And... I'm going to give you my view as to why that is. So, in my opinion, the thing that powered Fifty Shades of Grey to its status as sort of a cultural touchstone was that it tapped into something very specific among specific readers, particularly middle-aged wine moms and young adult, new adult readers who were looking for something that was slightly risque and intentionally unhealthy, but still tapped into their sense of, I don't want to say moral virtue, but that's basically what it is. Essentially, it was risque enough that it could be published without being like hardcore fetish content. People were attracted to it because of the fact that the romance is so unhealthy and the fact that the female character is literally redeeming him. A lot of critiques about Fifty Shades of Grey and a lot of critiques about the Mr. and then the Mrs. focus on the fact that it's unhealthy, and they act like this is a strike against the book, which is weird to me because this is the intention of the book. She's not ineptly writing an unhealthy romance. The unhealthy romance is the appeal. It is the whole reason it exists. She's intentionally writing this because that's what she wants to write. She wants the unhealthy romance. She wants the character to redeem the unhealthy guy. And the reality is that lots of people also want that, even if they won't outwardly say this. Fifty Shades of Grey essentially hit the perfect sweet spot where it could be naughty and risque and essentially softcore porn, but it could be inept enough where people could say, oh, I don't like it because of that. I like it because it's really risque. I like it because it's stupid and funny and I can laugh at it. And, oh, look how inept this is. In other words, it comes off very similar to how people would say things like, oh, I only like Rocky Horror because of the songs. I'm not into insert subculture here. Like, it's the same sort of thing where people don't feel comfortable with saying that they like it for the reason that they like it. And I can actually prove that this is the case. But the question we have to ask is, why was this a thing in the first place? Like, why were they attracted to such a thing? Why did they need a way to say, oh, I'm not really into this unhealthy relationship? And the reality of this is that 
there's no good way to put this, but basically there's been a cultural shift over the years where as porn has become more ubiquitous, there has been a movement, I guess you can say, among people to shove fetish content and kink content into the closet, essentially, where there has been a demarcation for a lot of people between good kink and bad kink. And while that's always been the case, it's turned into a thing where people now openly proclaim what they think is good and what they think is bad, and we kind of need to talk about that. The reality is, is that if you're in a lot of subcultures, your identity has never been easier to kind of indulge in openly. One of the good things about the internet is it exposed a lot of people to a lot of things. But one of the bad things about the internet is it made it very easy for lots of people to find lots of things, specifically certain subgroups, certain cultures. And these cultures, in many ways, spurred discussions about things like, is this healthy versus unhealthy? And this is not a conversation that happened in the past. Now, on some level, it's good to understand that in real life, healthy kink and healthy boundaries and all of these things are very important. But that's a fundamentally different conversation and a different argument than arguing that these sorts of kinks and fetishes do not have interest among the wider population. To put it like this, in the past, there were all kinds of films made for all kinds of reasons. There was all kinds of exploitation films, which were usually raunchy and sexual and, quite honestly, countercultural. And you got a full spectrum of what that meant. Essentially, you would run the full gamut from things like Deep Throat and various countercultures like black exploitation to really offensive things to most people's senses like Elsa, she wolf of the SS. You would get a full run of all kinds of things and they existed essentially in a very cornered off part of society where access to these things really required you to know somebody who knew somebody or to be friends with somebody who ran a video store. With the existence of the internet, access to these things became much easier for both good and for ill. Awareness of things like boundaries and consent is very good. This has been a healthier change for society, but the problem is, is that it's also required a kind of moral puritanism where specific ideas and interests are dubbed as being good and certain ones are dubbed as being bad and people are expected to publicly affirm these things constantly. And on one hand, it's usually good to publicly affirm that certain things are good. Affirming that, yeah, it's a bad thing to be a bad person. It's a bad thing to violate people's, you know, comfort zones. These things are bad. What's not so good is that you can't really deny that there's not a desire for these things, and we know that that's the case because we have things like search engine statistics. For example, the most searched kind of porn among conservatives is cuckolding porn. The most searched for kind of porn among liberals is bondage porn, specifically the unhealthy kind of erotica that E.L. James will write. Last year, for example, the fifth most kind of searched porn on Pornhub was therapy porn, specifically the relationship between a therapist and a patient. Now, I think we're all adult enough to say that in real life, that sort of thing is abhorrently wrong. It is a power dynamic that is completely imbalanced, and in real life, that sort of thing is wrong. But that's fundamentally different from saying that there's no desire for that dynamic because it exists. We know it exists because content is being made to sate a need 
or I guess a want in this case. It's a product that exists because the market demands that it exist. This is, unfortunately, a very uncomfortable topic for a lot of people. And you kind of need to talk about it because when you talk about the success of Fifty Shades of Grey, when you talk about why does the mister exist, why does it sell so many copies, there's an urge to say that it's, oh, because everyone wants to read it because it's bad. There's an urge to sort of push away the idea that people actually want this because it makes us feel uncomfortable. It's my belief that the fetishization of a certain thing, specifically unhealthy power dynamics, is intrinsic to the Mr. and to Fifty Shades of Grey, respectively. These are things that cannot be removed from these stories, and their success tells me that as much as people want to say that this kind of thing doesn't exist, or that we shouldn't want this kind of thing, the reality is it's a bit like cocaine. People will seek it out and get it themselves. I don't think it helps anyone when trying to analyze this book to bring a sort of morality into it, because whether this is right or wrong in the real world, it's wrong in the real world, that's an answer. In the concept of fantasy and the concept of what people enjoy privately, you can't really make that sort of moral judgment for them. If you do, then you're probably on the side of companies like Visa and MasterCard, which decide what kind of porn you're allowed to consume. If you don't believe me about this, then look at what, at the time of this writing, Gumroad is going through, which is a platform for creators which has now, once again, completely removed erotic content, despite the fact that a large portion of of their creators, create erotic content. The same thing happened on Tumblr a few years ago. The reality is, is that when you create this sort of moral puritanism, it hurts the most vulnerable among us. It hurts those who are on the bottom. It's not going to stop giant creators from creating because they already have the protection they need. Someone like E.L. James is not going to be hurt because MasterCard has decided what kind of porn you can watch. She can create her content and publish it through a publisher who has already tacitly approved of what she's doing. Furthermore, it's my opinion that attempting to shove certain kinks and certain fetishes and certain ideas that people think are bad deeper and deeper into the closet to hide them away doesn't actually make them go away. It makes them sneakier and more insidious because it forces creators to do the same thing that they did with things like evil queens and the gay stereotype villain because they made it so you couldn't show certain traits positively. You couldn't have a gay protagonist. You couldn't have a strong woman female character. And so those characters, which is well known now, were shoved into the role of villains. Villains, because they were evil, were allowed to be flamboyantly gay. You got to see evil queens who were boisterous and loud and overtly sexual. These were allowed because they were the villains, quote-unquote. There is a long history of this with everything from gay people to trans people. Anyone even remotely familiar with those kinds of subcultures will understand how they had to survive, and similar things happen with similar kinds of kinks. Now, don't take that to mean that I am relating these two things equally in terms of morality or popularity or anything like that. This is not a moral judgment. I'm not making that. But I can give examples of what I mean. The complete removal of certain topics outside of what you might consider the norm, the hiding of things that make us uncomfortable makes it easier for bad actors to slip them in unknown, similar to how E.L. James did it. E.L. James took an unhealthy relationship, put it aside what was a quote-unquote redemption romance, and essentially managed to get it out into the mainstream. This is something which happens in a lot of forms of media. If, 
For example, you are at all familiar with the controversies surrounding all of those various shows that were made by Nickelodeon, like iCarly and things like that, you'll know that the director slash writer put plenty of weird foot fetish content in those shows, and he was blatant about it. But because so many things involving that were never talked about, nobody noticed until much later when they realized it and went back and looked and realized, oh, this is really creepy and really screwed up but it flew under the radar. And it did so primarily because a lot of people didn't have exposure to the signs. A lot of people were not exposed to thinking like this, and in many ways, they still aren't. Look at children's channels on YouTube. There is a fine line on many of them between kids' content and fetish content. Look at things like slime content, which is everywhere. There's all kinds of other content that's all over children's YouTube, and it is blatantly sexual, but it plays it in such a way that they have plausible deniability in the same way that E.L. James does. So she can say things like, I think BDSM is a mental illness, and people will go, oh, she just doesn't understand BDSM. No, she understands BDSM very well. She's just into non-consensual BDSM. That's her fantasy. And that brings us back to the mister. It brings us to Fifty Shades of Grey, because it is impossible to talk about these things, in my opinion, without talking about the fact that E.L. James is clearly wanting to write erotica. She clearly wants to write fetish content. She wants to write non-consensual sex. That's what she wants to write. In fact, it's played as a joke in The Mister with this scene that seems like it was written by lawyers so that the main protagonist woman will consent. Like, they go back and forth asking, are you sure you want this? Yes. Do you consent to this? Yes. It reads like a lawyer wrote it, and it's played as almost a joke because, again, in her mind, the fetish, the fantasy that she's into is specifically a power dynamic that is unbalanced. She's really into the idea that there's this overbearing guy and he's controlling of the woman. She finds that particularly interesting and, in many ways, particularly arousing. She finds the idea of a woman who can redeem an unhealthy man to be alluring. She finds this to be an attractive proposition. When people talk about how, oh, she could make this into a great thriller or a horror movie if she just turned a few things differently, you're missing the point. She's not accidentally writing a horror movie. She's not ineptly writing a romance. She's very specifically writing fetish content. She's very specifically writing her fantasy. And... If you don't catch that, if you're not looking at it as that, if you're not looking at it as, what is the goal here? Then you're sort of missing the whole point. You're not really able to evaluate what's going on. You can't really grasp why certain things happen the way they do if you don't understand the narrative tropes that are being played with. A lot of this, I think, flies under the radar, specifically because people aren't used to evaluating major publications and best-selling books the way they would evaluate random porn. But if you evaluate E.L. James's book, or books, I should say, as romance books, they're terrible. But if you evaluate them the way you would evaluate or plot out a porno, everything falls into place. Her writing is still atrocious. She's a terrible writer when it comes to just conveying ideas through text. She is repetitive, and I don't think anyone will be surprised to know that it's really hard to read her stories, because they're not very evocative. But if you sit down and plot the plot points that she comes up with, they're not out of place in a porn. And that's deliberate. She's relying almost explicitly on the reader's understanding this 
subconsciously, or at least understanding the narrative tropes she's playing with. She's not playing with romance narrative tropes. She's playing with porn narrative tropes. So to give you an idea of what I mean by porn's narrative tropes, the most stereotypical, parodied, like, lampooned idea of a porno is the handyman comes over to the housewife and they have sex because she's found a reason to call the handyman. This is lampooned for decades. In fact, there's a game called Plumbers Don't Wear Ties. It is literally this concept in really early FMV form. But the entire setup is straightforward and right there. There's not a huge amount of story to work with. There aren't a huge amount of plot points to work with because they don't need that. It's very straightforward. You have a guy. He's a plumber. He goes to this woman's house because she's called him. She's lonely. They strike up a conversation. They make innuendo and then they fuck. That's all the plot you need. If you're trying to write that as a romance story, you need a lot more than that, because these characters are not nearly fleshed out enough. But, if you think about E.L. James's writing as porn, then what you have are these, essentially, same building blocks. You have a rich man who is a sex addict. You have an innocent girl who has just come here from another country. You have a setup where rich man, who is also nobility, because of course he is, is interested in her because of her virtue and her chastity and her purity and all these other buzzwords that you can throw in here. And then obviously they get alone or they try to find reasons to be alone. And then they have lots of sex in lots of places over and over again. This is a porno. There's not a lot of plot points for a romance because... She's not writing a romance, even though in The Mister, it seems like she's actually trying to do that. But at least in Fifty Shades of Grey, it's very clear that what they've done is take smut fic and apply it to a standard narrative format. And it doesn't work, because it's clearly not written to be that. In a romance, you need things like, you know, character arcs, and motivation, and, I don't know... Things to happen. But in a porno, you don't need any of that. The audience isn't there for that. The audience is there to see a setup and a payoff. And that's it. There doesn't need to be anything deeper than that in a porn. And James knows this. Arguably, she didn't do any more work to make it a romance. Which is why both of these books, The Mrs. and The Mr. respectively, feel like short stories that have been expanded to novel length on the back of padding, because that's what they are. But now, after 30 minutes of talking about this, and talking about fetishes, and talking about E.L. James wanting to write this, we need to talk about the fact that the reason why The Mister is so interesting, narratively speaking, is because she's trying to write a slow burn romance, too in a way that she wasn't with Fifty Shades. Fifty Shades is basically porn. I've said this over and over. She's not trying to write a romance there, and it doesn't work because of that. But The Mister has almost two stories. In fact, you can essentially see chapter to chapter which story idea she's running with. So there's some chapters that are very slow burn and not a lot happens and it's all focused on the characters and then there are other chapters where it's clear that she's switched back into erotica mode and she's writing like straight erotica fanfic or fic in general I guess it's not fanfic anymore but she's clearly switching between these two tracks and the real problem is that they run parallel to each other you can't do both you can't have these two things coexisting neatly together. You can't write unhealthy, boundary-violating erotica and also write healthy, uwu like slow-burn romance. You can't. These two things are in contrast to each other. They are constantly in conflict. Because either A you have to have the boundary violations be, like, 
abhorrent to the girl, or you want her to like them. You can't have it both ways. If she likes them, then you're veering into either A, porn, or B, a brainwashing story where we're, as an audience, feeling uncomfortable. Like, usually in a story, the violation of boundaries, quite rightly, is a moment of horror and trauma and things like that. If you play it straight in a romance... If you play it in a porn, it's none of those things, because porn doesn't have the same sort of emotional investment that romance does. E.L. James wants the mister to have all of the emotional investment of a romance story with all of the nothing-really-matters of a porno. And so she's got these weird set, like juxtapositions where they will do kinky sex, or she will indulge in the uneven power dynamic, and she will then try to seamlessly transition into, oh, this is actually a sweet, long-term, slow-burn romance. And the problem is, is that it's jarring. It feels like you're reading two different stories that have been Frankenstein together. Now, this actually gave me some... How do I put this? It gave me flashbacks to a different creator in a completely different genre. But what it made me think of was a guy by the name of Godfrey Ho. Now, for those of you who are unaware of weird 80s exploitation action films, specifically ones that came out of Hong Kong, Godfrey Ho was a film director, and what he would do is he would shoot half of a movie, and then he would take a foreign film, which for him meant American movies, and he would cut them in half and redub over them. And so what would happen is you would have original footage for half of the movie, and you would have footage from this other movie he found for the other half. And because he redubbed over it, he would make it sort of kind of seem like these two plots were related because Like, a character would pick up a phone and talk over a dubbed voice. And then, in movie B, another character would pick up a phone. And they would talk as though these two plots and stories had anything to do with one another. In reality, they didn't. And so, it always comes off like movie A is happening, and then cut, and then you have completely different film, and it's movie B. And they are only loosely attached to each other. It was kind of his trademark as a, like, director. And that's what the mister makes me think of. The mister makes me think of Godfrey Ho, because James will write scenes, and then suddenly it's like, okay, that chapter is over, and now we're in book B, where it's a romance, but now that part is over, so now we're back to book A, the erotic porno. But again, there's no way to structure this where these two things work in tandem. To give you an example of what I mean, let's imagine for a second that she paced this whole thing like a romance. Now, in a romance, you want the majority of your book to be built up. You don't want to immediately rush into the romance. This is why in movies, for example, it takes them three acts to get to the kiss. Because the whole point is to make your audience want the outcome that you're moving towards. You have to build and build and build and build so that when the romance, the kiss, the sex, whatever happens, your audience is invested. But imagine that it's structured like this. James wrote a romance and it builds and builds and builds and builds and then the end, the climax, is him violating her boundaries and breaking her trust. That is not romantic. It's not sexual, it's not sensual, it's not fun. It's horrific, and it's uncomfortable, and most people probably wouldn't be into that. So, instead of that, now let's structure this like a porno, where you start off with them meeting, you don't do very much character development, and then you have them essentially either immediately start kissing or showing their interest, 
or you very quickly transition into them doing sexual things. Because pacing-wise, you don't want your audience to get bored. They're there for a reason. They're there for a very specific reason. And so you don't want them to be disinterested. You don't want them to be like, just get on with it already. You want them to be invested right away. You want them to be into it right away. But once you do that, once you have given them the payoff, once the sex has happened, once the romance or whatever, the point of the porn you're writing has happened, it's usually over. Like, if you just want to write a sex scene, you just write a sex scene. There's a reason why most, like, porn in the modern age is, like, 20 minutes long. It's not meant to be long, because the audience isn't looking for that. The audience is not looking for a 90-minute movie that's porn-related. They're looking for, like, a 20-minute wank session. If you're writing erotica, that's really what you're going for. Now, granted, if you're writing book erotica, then you have to write lots of different sex scenes so that your audience can get invested with the sex scenes uh, over multiple sessions. But, she's trying to write this like it's also a romance, which means that she essentially sprints to the sex scene, and then there's like two-thirds of the book left. And she has to come up with things to happen, and has to do all of this character development after they've already engaged in what is ostensibly the climax of the plot she's doing. In other words, if we're analyzing the arc of this story, if we're analyzing and plotting out the different plot points along like a graph, where the climax happens is different. In a romance, it adheres more to the traditional story structure where there's all of this rising action and then a climax. And then you have essentially just the conclusion to write. But if we assume that it's the same length and she's writing a porn, then you need multiple climaxes, essentially. Pun not intended, but the analogy holds. Because the thing is, if you don't do that, if you don't have multiple stages of rising action and then climax, what you have is one-third sprints to the, the climax, and then the remainder is conclusion. And so you're just sort of like descending and drawing out the rest of it. Your conclusion, the length of your conclusion, is way too long. If you look at a normal story plot progression graph, you'll notice that the conclusion is even steeper than the rising action. The rising action is very often plotted as a curve, whereas the conclusion and the end of the book is essentially a straight line, and that's deliberate, because Normally, you want your conclusion to happen somewhere at the two-thirds to three-fourths mark of your book. E.L. James, because she's trying to write a porno plot in a romance, has essentially made it so that her climax hits roughly at the one-third, one-half mark, and then she has no idea what to do for the rest of the book, because... If you're there for a romance, this is not a good romance. It's not nearly detailed enough, and you haven't been able to invest in the characters because she's not interested in making these traditional romantic characters. She's not willing or interested in writing them as though they are three-dimensional characters. She's writing them as though they could be played by any porn actor or any porn actress. Furthermore, if you're only interested in smut, then A... This is way too softcore to be interesting, but also it goes on way too long. You hit the climax and then you have the rest of the book, and there's way cheaper and way less dense and way better written stuff by other authors. In other words, there is no way to do this correctly. There is absolutely no way to ever do something like this. It's fundamentally impossible simply from a narrative structure point of view. 
there are ways you could theoretically do it. Because, again, there have been plenty of porns that are 90 minutes or more. But the reality is, is that in writing form, this doesn't work at all. And they're constantly fighting each other. Every impulse that she has to do one or the other takes away from the other thing she's not writing at that moment. When she's writing the porn part, it's taking away space. It's taking away time. It's taking away focus from the romance part. Conversely, when she writes the romance part, it's taking away space and time and focus from the erotica part. These two things cannot coexist. Now, what I mean specifically by this is that the unhealthy erotica part can't coexist. You could do quote-unquote healthy erotica and a romance just fine, but the problem is that she specifically, for her fantasy, for her fetish, wants the unhealthy part, and there's no way to do that and also capture all of the people who she wants to cater to. And this, as a sort of conclusion, brings us to a weird thing I've noticed across, I don't want to say romance books, but across the internet, I guess. There is a lot of really poorly done fetish material out there. And I, being a 30-something male... Don't spend a lot of time on things like TikTok. I don't. And so I was fundamentally unaware of this thing called book talk. Fundamentally unaware because I don't watch TikToks. I don't care for short form video in general. I find it to be really annoying and not what I'm interested in. So the existence of it was a mystery to me. But I started looking up and started seeing more and more things that people were saying were because of it, that things were coming into being because of it. And I started looking up reviews, and I started looking up the books that were being promoted because of this subculture. And what I noticed is that its existence is the exact reason why something like The Mister exists. It is. With Fifty Shades, I said that it was chasing wide moms and slightly young adult edgelords into new adult. And it was banking on the fact that it was just risque enough and just poorly written enough that you could get away with excusing why you actually liked it. But, Book Talk and The Mister are linked, in my view, because the culture that I talked about half an hour ago, where there's a desire to publicly state that you hold moral-slash-ethical beliefs regarding your sex life, means that something like the mister can exist for outrage clicks and bait. Because essentially... She's banking on the fact that people will read it and go, oh, look at this unhealthy kink. I'm now going to make a TikTok where I say how unhealthy this kink is and how bad it is. And also, you should read it yourself to see how bad it is. Essentially, what's happening is that you have all these authors who are writing softcore erotica, who are writing unhealthy erotica, but it's couched in this idea that, oh, look at these bad authors who write bad romances. They're calling them what they're not. They're saying that, oh, these are badly, ineptly written romances, and that's not what they are. These are eroticas that are being directly marketed to people who are going to say that these are bad because they want to make a moral point, but at the same time are advertising them to all of their followers. It's going viral by way of moral puritanism, and it's weird. This is why things like Fourth Wing, 
end up being made. This is why, you know, books like A Mortal's Handbook try and fail to bank on this very concept. They do this because they fundamentally understand that the audience that they're seeking, the people who will do all of their advertising and word of mouth for them are not the people who are actually into this unhealthy BDSM kink. The people who are going to advertise it to all of their friends are the people who are going to look at this and say, look at this unhealthy romance. Isn't this terrible? Isn't this unhealthy? Don't they know things like boundaries, etc., etc.? And their friends, who probably are into the unhealthy part, unironically, are going to go, oh yeah, it's so bad. I'm so sad that I spent all this time reading this, and uh, I can't believe that something like this got read, like got made. But in reality, what's happening is that everybody's laughing, but only half of the people are actually laughing. In the same way that when Fifty Shades came out, lots of people said, oh, I like it because it's, it's so, you know, it's so bad. Oh, I like it because it's so unrealistic. And the reality is, is that lots and lots of people liked it unironically, but socially couldn't say that. And we know that because if it was just because it was funny, people would not have made it a bestseller. They wouldn't have bought it to that extent. There wouldn't have been movies made that people went and saw. It just It's the same thing kind of with Twilight in a lot of ways. Twilight has the same thing. Stephanie Meyer has the same exact audience for a reason. For all the people who are like, oh yeah, I totally saw it because it's the worst thing ever. I was there, man. I saw those people. Those people were unironically Team Jacob or Team Edward. Those people were invested. And they might have said, oh yeah, I'm totally only into it because it's so bad. Oh, I'm only into it ironically. But they weren't. And everybody kind of knows that. They were into it because they were really into, like, this idea of an overpowering and like, slightly stalkerish or totally stalkerish vampire who is totally into them. They were totally into the idea of the overprotected, like, alpha male, you know, Taylor Lautner figure. I mean, the whole frickin', like, Twilight Saga probably launched the whole, like, fascination with alpha males in young adult and new adult fiction. It basically did that. And there's a reason for that. People can pretend that it that it didn't happen because of that. People can claim that, oh, no, that's not really why people like it, but the numbers don't lie, okay? The reality is, is that for a lot of people, it is socially unacceptable to say that you like certain things unironically, that you have these sort of kinks. But the reality is, is that people do. And... E.L. James knows what she's doing. E.L. James knows exactly what she's doing. She's not a good writer, okay? She is, in many ways, a terrible writer. But she is a masterful marketer. She knows exactly the kinds of people who will talk about her book. She knows exactly the kind of people who are going to read her book. She knows her audience, and her audience love her, even if they won't admit that publicly. The reality is, is that there is a whole host of different kinks which are extremely popular to lots of people, which have been essentially marked as taboo when nobody treats them as real taboos. Sort of like how swearing is not actually a taboo. We, in many ways, call things like the word fuck as profanity, but it's not really profanity. Profanity refers to something that's profane, something which saying it alone is cause for reproach. The closest thing that we have in modern day to real profanity are racial slurs, things that you don't even say. You won't feel good saying them because you've been conditioned not to say them, rightly so. That's what real profanity is. When you say things like the N-word, words that you will not say in anyone's company because they are profane, that's real profanity. That's real taboo. In 
Unfortunately, modern society, we have a lot of things, kink-wise or fetish-wise, that have been shoved into the realm of the taboo when everybody sort of openly consents to liking them. They'll cop to liking them, but they won't admit to liking them. In the same way that something like copaganda is popular, but nobody wants to admit that it's popular. There's a reason why there's lots of cop shows that Law & Order has been on the air for like 30 years. There's a reason for this. It's because people like it. People want to watch this. We can talk inevitably about how harmful it is and about the fact that it's distorted how people view the cops and that it probably has a really bad impact on society. But you can't argue that it doesn't exist because people don't like it. If people didn't like it, they wouldn't watch it, and it wouldn't still be on the air. They're not putting it on the air to no one watching it. They're putting it on the air and spending all the money to put it on the air because people want it. E.L. James understands this. That's why she wrote this. That's why she wrote The Mister. That's why she wrote Fifty Shades of Grey. She understands her audience. She understands what her audience wants. And so, when we talk about this as being a bad book... In some ways, it's intentionally bad, I think. In some ways, I think she wrote this as almost a wink and a nod to her audience to give them plausible deniability. Because nobody was going to read the tagline from the author of Fifty Shades of Grey and expect Lord of the Rings. Nobody was going to walk into this and think, oh yeah, she's totally going to write the notebook this time. She's going to write, you know, th the next great American romance. No, nobody thinks that. As soon as you put that tagline from the author of Fifty Shades of Grey, you know exactly what you are in for. And she's banking on that. You could argue that her writing is atrocious, because it is. And you can argue that she's inept, because in many ways, in terms of just basic writing structure, she is. But she's a masterful marketer. She is somebody who understands the audience she has perhaps better than they understand themselves. And she understands that any publicity is good publicity. Because everybody I've seen who's talked about this book focuses in depth on, like, the nitty-gritty when it's really a forest for the trees situation. You can't see the forest because you're too busy looking at the trees. They're blocking your view. But it's kind of insane because to me, this book is, like, a perfect representation of modern erotica culture where everybody's too embarrassed to say they're into something that's morally unacceptable in a real-world context. And, again, there's nothing wrong with saying that in a real-world context, between real living people, certain things are very unhealthy and very bad. In fact, it's very good to say those things. It's good and positive to say boundaries are important, that you should respect your partner, that you shouldn't do things that are going to hurt other people, knowingly or unknowingly. But, that doesn't change the fact that in a fantasy context, there's a desire for this. In the same way that, again, as soon as the motion picture codes in the 50s were repealed in the 60s, you suddenly got a ton of movies about infidelity. There's a reason why that happened. It was because there was a desire, and the market will move to meet that desire. Ultimately, I think what the mister is, I think what the mister represents is far more interesting than anything actually written in the book. I think that it's a perfect encapsulation, as I said, about modern fetish culture, about the way that we talk about it, about the way that we feel comfortable talking about it, about the fact that not just people we know like this, people who you would probably never think, oh, I'm sure they're... Oh, totally pure. They would never be actually into this. They are. And those are probably people very close to us. And that makes us uncomfortable to think about the fact that your mom or your grandma or your aunts or your sisters or your daughters 
or your sons or fathers or uncles or whatever, that they might be into stuff like this weirds us out. But the reality is, is there are people too. And as anyone who's lost a parent or grandparent can say when you're digging through their stuff, uh, they are people. And they're into things, even if they don't talk to you about it. But the mister is a terrible piece of writing that amazingly is a perfect encapsulation of this moment. I don't know that it will work or even be able to function 10 years from now. I don't know that it would have functioned 10 years ago. But right now, it sort of sums up this whole, like, moment where every author seems to be chasing this young adult audience specifically because they are all trying very hard to constantly talk about what they're into and what they're not into because there is a bunch of people who are terminally online who spent all their time defining themselves by what they like and what they don't like and they spend all of their time loudly proclaiming this to all of their followers and fans, you know, you end up with this kind of book. You end up with this. Like, if it was just a bad romance book, if it was just a bad erotica book, nobody would care. There's hundreds of bad erotica books. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of bad romance books. There are so many, more and more produced every day. You can go on Amazon Kindle right now. You can go on Wattpad right now. You can go on fanfiction.net. You can go on AO3. You can go on Tumblr and find some of the worst eroticas and romances known to man. And most of them are never going to be read by 99% of the people who read stuff like this. This got made, this got popular, this got name recognition because it knows its audience, because of a very specific cultural imperative, or at the very least, cultural trend that exists. And I don't know necessarily how to feel about that, and I don't know where we're going. But I do know that it's more interesting than anything that happens in The Mister, and anything that's happened in any of E.L. James's books. So, I know The Misses came out, and it's more of the same, so there's no whole lot, not a whole lot to talk about, and maybe she'll write a third book. Honestly, I kind of wish she would just, like, jump into the deep end and write, like, I don't know, a, a, like a hard, like, X-rated movie or something. Like, I would love to see her just drop all pretense and write just straight erotica. Because it's clearly what she wants. I don't know why she's... I mean, well, I do know why. I've just spent a whole lot of time talking about why. But it, it feels like it's an obligation for her more than something she cares about. Because all of her interest is clearly in the erotica part. <sighs> okay. That's the mister. I have talked for an hour. That's way too long to talk about this kind of thing. But hopefully, you are coming away from this with a better understanding of all these different things that I've talked about. Hopefully, you have a different perspective than you'll probably see from like 99% of book reviewers out there. Or at least I feel like I've given that. I think because so many channels on YouTube are worried about getting demonetized, they don't want to talk about certain contexts or certain topics, and I get that, but... I'm not a big enough channel to be monetized, so I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I will talk about these things because I feel like, quite honestly, they're worth talking about. Like, quite honestly, I feel like there's no way to really talk about this without getting into the kinds of things that will get you demonetized. So, that's my take on the mister, on E.L. James, uh, on Book Talk, and on modern romance fetish stuff. Hopefully you found this informative. Hopefully you found this perspective different or enlightening or well thought out. Uh, and I don't know what I'm going to do next. Uh, but 
yeah, that's all I have to say about this one. So, uh, thanks for listening. This story really sucks. See y'all later.